Great. So, um, thank you to the organizers, Jaroslav and others, for having me here at this uh, ob obviously historic event, uh, the uh, first uh, conference in game studies in uh, Central and Eastern Europe as, as, a, as a sort of a whole. Uh, <clears throat> this is a very good year for uh, uh, game studies, I guess. Uh, there was, uh, as we will hear from Bjarke later, there was the first uh, uh, Chinese uh, Digital Games Research Association conference uh, in Ningbo, uh, and, and now this, and hey, we have uh, Gamergate this year. So it seems to be a, a great year. Um, so what should, I <clears throat> what should I talk about? Um, uh, there's a lot to say, and, and there's many challenges, and I, of course, won't touch most of them. Uh, hopefully, I'll be here, of course, uh, all the conference, so hopefully we can have many discussions about that. I do know something about uh, uh, running and establishing something like a field like this, since I have been thinking about it for uh, about around 30 years, which probably makes me the oldest person in this room as well. I'm, I'm only guessing now, but uh, it doesn't look far off. Um, so, if, I, um, if I'm happy, um, uh, please also allow me to be grumpy, since I'm old, okay? Um, so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's me. Uh, so, uh, the, um, uh, the past and the present and the futures of, of this strange field called game studies. Uh, or maybe we are going from something like a casual uh, game uh, via some sort of single-player adventures that some of us had un until lots of Guild war Wars. I remember ludology and narratology, I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. And of course, maybe at some point we'll reach the serious games uh, industry of academia. Uh, so, uh, what is this? Well, yeah, it's, it's basically just some field notes from me. Um, and I, I should, I, I'll try to keep down the grumpiness until the end. Um, so, should I speak up? All right, sorry about that. Oh, no, I should not speak up. Um, all right, how's that? Even worse. Good. All right. <clears throat> so here I am, finally. You didn't hear what I said. That's okay. I didn't say very much interesting stuff. Um, so there are, of course, as I said, many things I can't really have the time for here. I have a confession to make. My name is Espen. I have too many slides. Uh, so sorry about that. You will see it. Um, yeah. So there are lots of things I could go on about. Uh, for instance, uh, there are many challenges. I've solved some of them, uh, basically. You know, the, the question of whether games are stories or not. Uh, I had a paper a couple of years ago that took care of all of that, so you don't have to worry about that anymore. There's also the question of, uh, are games some sort of fiction? Uh, I've solved that too, uh, so don't worry. I have a paper in this year's DIGRO which takes care of that, but I don't have time to go into it. If you're interested, please ask me in the break. Uh, and of course, we have um, politics, right? So here we have this uh, 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 many uh, upstarts in game studies around the world. Uh, and uh, there is the question of how do you do it? Uh, maybe a regional focus is good, like, like this one. We have a precedent for that, of course, in the Scandinavian countries, uh, where we early on uh, managed to gather people from Denmark, Sweden, uh, and Norway, and Finland. Uh, and that has worked out quite well. You, you may know the Nordic DIGRA conference. Uh, maybe some of you have even been to one. No? Oh, that's good, because then you would have recognized some of my slides. Uh, so anyway, so we have this, uh, but I'm, I don't really care too much about politics. Uh, if I did, I wouldn't be here. I would be in politics. In, in the Nordic countries, we were very lucky, because we had a very good infrastructure for research. We could basically think up new research fields, and if it sounded interesting enough, they would fund the, the, the government's uh, funding bodies would actually fund it, fund it to a much larger degree than you find in, say, small countries like the U.S., where when you're a PhD student, you can only do what they tell you to do. Um, or if you try not to, then, as we will see, it doesn't go so well. So we were quite lucky in the Nordic countries, uh, and uh, maybe that could be a model, I don't know. Uh, but I think that what you have here, the, as uh, you know, Central and Eastern Europe, is, seems to be a very good uh, focus. Uh, for, for something like this. So I, I definitely uh, think that that's something you should stay with and develop. Um, so what is this field? Is it a field or is it even a discipline? I'm not sure it's a discipline. I've actually misused that word a couple of times, uh, talking about game studies as a discipline. I, I don't think it is. I don't think it should be a discipline. That's just too harsh. 
It, maybe it's a multidiscipline. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit uh, later on. Uh, but what happened? Okay, so uh, basically in the 80s, or to be exact, around 1980, uh, there was people uh, thinking about games uh, in a way which made, or computer games, which made them into a central research object for them. Um, the first paper, or the first PhD, on games, on computer games, was uh, by uh, a guy called Thomas Malone, and he wrote this thing called What Makes uh, Things, he was a psychologist, he wrote uh, this thesis, What Makes Things Fun to Learn, a study of intrinsically motivating computer games. So this was basically games and learning uh, very early on. Um, and um, interestingly, I mean, if you haven't read that, you definitely should go and check it out. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting first uh, attempt at, at capturing uh, not only if games are useful for learning, but what are games, really? Uh, and so he did something which, uh, he came up with three concepts that he thought would be, uh, were central to understand games. Uh, so challenge, uh, fantasy, and curiosity. Th those were his three key terms. Um, and I think there's, if you, if you uh, read uh, later attempts, you, you see that this is not too far off what people are still trying to figure out today. Uh, also, he was the first that I know who made this very important distinction between uh, the uh, mechanical internal structures of the games and the uh, communicative verbal textual uh, visual surface uh, system sign systems of the games he talked he called them intrinsic versus uh, extrinsic fantasy that's what he called them but basically he's talking about the the skin of the game and the uh, mechanics of the game and how these two relates and how they work for instance in terms of how can we learn something from games? What can games teach us when we have these two layers uh, and they're not always, uh, they're not always uh, uh, sort of in touch? I mean, think of uh, Clint Hawking's uh, recent uh, term, uh, uh, ludonarrative dissonance. That's exactly the same thing that uh, Malone was talking about in 1980. And we seem to be reinventing this wheel ever since 1980. Um, so, um, the first conference on video games ever was uh, at Harvard, of course. Unfortunately, you could say, but Harvard did it. Uh, it was called Video Games and Human Development. Uh, it gathered 110 people back in 1983. Uh, if, of course, it wasn't the first international conference. It was just a national, small US conference. But still, they, they did it first. Uh, and they were discussing things like, well, games are not dangerous. They can teach us useful skills. Uh, video games don't create zombies. That's a direct quote from that conference. Uh, and uh, Patricia Greenfield uh, from UCLA uh, talked about how video games would replace television. Now, uh, that was in 1983, and it seems to be the sort of thing we're still talking about, right? We're still trying to stem the, uh, the uh, moral panics and uh, talk about how games can be useful. Uh, so it doesn't seem like we have, in, in more than uh, 30 years, it doesn't seem that we have really progressed all that lot. We're still singing the same songs that they were singing back then. And um, uh, a few years later, two years later to be exact, we had the first uh, humanities dissertation on games, Marianne Buckle's uh, PhD on the adventure game, Adventure. Uh, now, Marianne Buckles uh, is not here. Uh, she is the true pioneer of game studies. She was the first person to write a dissertation in the field, and uh, she was the first person also then to suffer uh, what many of us have suffered, perhaps to lesser extents, uh, trying to break through with a new topic in an existing environment, uh, an existing uh, department, for instance. Uh, I don't know how many of you have tried that. You're all alone in your apartment writing about games, they don't really like what you do. You, they think you are good, and I think you're wasting your time. Has anybody had that experience? No? Well, a few people, right. So, so she was the first, right? So, and, and what happened to her? Well, of course, it was a bit strange. She was at the University of San Diego, uh, sorry, um, uh, California, San Diego, and uh, she was in the German department, the German literature department, and she was writing about an English-speaking video game. So that, that already there, perhaps, she made too much trouble for herself. But, they let her finish, but they gave her a lot of trouble. So when she finally got her dissertation approved, uh, she was so frustrated by uh, her experience in the academia that she left uh, academia altogether and became a massage therapist. Uh, and according to her, later in interviews, much happier uh, for making that move. Uh, so that's what happens to the true pioneers. 
Uh, they don't survive, they don't last, they end up happier. <laughs> well, um, so uh, let that be a lesson to us all. Um, of course, after that, there were some other things happening in the 80s as well. I mean, uh, we could mention uh, Brenda Laurel's important uh, uh, PhD on, on uh, uh, basically uh, Hamlet on the holodeck, except that she was talking about the, the same thing, this uh, fantasy, interactive fantasy entertainment system where you are playing the main role in a, uh, in a game or a, sort of a... a almost something like high art, tragic drama of the Aristotelian kind. Uh, that vision was first uh, uh, entertained in her dissertation, and uh, I guess uh, parts of the game industry is still trying to reach that goal of, of, of well-formed drama, but interactive. Um, in the 90s, uh, uh, we uh, also saw a number of books come out about games, so from PhDs to books, for instance, uh, Eugene Provenzo has an early, slightly moral panicky uh, book about uh, uh, how children respond to video games. It's interesting, I guess, mostly for its, uh, its uh, historical context. Uh, Brenda Laurel uh, wrote uh, a book called uh, Computers of Theatre, where she also expanded the notion of game interfaces into uh, theatre, using theatre as, as a metaphor for computer interfaces in general. Um, of course, uh, Janet Murray's uh, book, Hamlet on the Holodeck, expanding on these ideas. Uh, there's also, uh, very importantly, uh, uh, Justine Castle and Henry Jenkins' From uh, uh, Barbie to Mortal Kombat. Uh, and uh, so the 90s, uh, basically the book decade. Then, uh, I would say, from the OOs or noughties on, we get uh, a lot of things happening. Uh, we have journals, we have textbooks, finally, uh, programs, uh, teaching programs and centers. So in 2001, which uh, I think is the year when things sort of come together uh, on many fronts, uh, we have uh, uh, the first conferences. Uh, there's one at my university in ITU uh, in Copenhagen, uh, and that was the first one. Then Bristol followed up a few months later, uh, and there was also a conference in the US uh, called, very interestingly, Computer Game Conference. Uh, they wanted to call it the gaming conference, but gaming has uh, unfortunate connotations to gambling. So in the US you cannot use the word gaming in an academic context because uh, somebody thinks it's about game gambling instead. Uh, so <clears throat> we also, I think, uh, uh, importantly launched uh, the Game Studies Journal, uh, which I hope you're all familiar with. Uh, you don't have to pay a lot to read it, it's actually free. Uh, so you have no excuse. Uh, we uh, wanted to make a journal for three reasons. Uh, first of all, of course, we wanted uh, people to have a place to publish uh, the best research in games uh, studies. Uh, everybody could do that except me, since I was the main editor. I can't publish in my own journal. Uh, but uh, so, but that, was, that was one reason, not the only one. The other one, of course, is that by having a journal, we signal to the world, to the academic world, that here we have... Uh, a new field, a field that is serious, a field where you should uh, be able to get credit when you publish articles. So we made it as boring as possible to, to achieve that. It is on the web, but yes, it's, you, you can't post comments, there's no blog, anything, just plain boring academic articles to make, <clears throat> make it seem that this is a very serious field. The third reason, of course, is that, well, we don't publish everything we get. Uh, on, on the contrary, we, we have a uh, more than 80% rejection rate, so if, uh, if you uh, uh, don't get published, what you get is perhaps more important, that is good critical feedback, which will help you. And if you are the only person doing games in some far off or, or central university department, then maybe that's the best feedback you can get, since the people around you might not be able to do that. Uh, so that, that was the third and not least important reason for this journal. Uh, so, uh, and then of course the whole thing carried on. There was the uh, Tampere conference in 2002, very important. Uh, then at that point people started thinking that maybe we should organize this field uh, more permanently. And so in 2003 the first Digital Games Research Association conference was launched. It was a huge success. They had uh, 500 people there. I don't think it's ever been that big again, which is uh, an interesting paradox. Um, 
And of course, uh, at uh, my little university of uh, uh, IT University of Copenhagen, we formed the Center for Computer Games Research, which we think was the first sort of non-commercial re uh, interdisciplinary research center uh, of, of games in the world. We hope so, anyway. Um, and, uh, but we have never checked. We don't, we're not that interested in it. Uh, and also, uh, later on, uh, very importantly for me, uh, there was finally a journal I could publish in, Games and Culture, uh, uh, as you probably also are familiar with. So, I mean, what is there more to say? Uh, very, in, in about, uh, let's say, five years, we have created a new interdisciplinary academic field. Success, right? Everything is perfect, right? What more is there to say? No more challenges here. We've done it. And it was almost 10 years ago. So, why, why worry? Okay, we can go on. I can step down, you can c continue with the conference, right? There's no more problems, I guess, right? Or maybe not. Uh, because if we look back for, on these 30 years, uh, what have we achieved? What have we made? What have we managed? What, have, what are our results here? Can we brag about something at all in those 30 years? Have we made a difference to anybody outside our own field? Well, I don't know. There's been a lot of solo work, right? There's a lot of books. By now, there's too many books, perhaps. I don't know. Some people think they sell and therefore they publish them, I guess. Um, but if we look away from paper, uh, we uh, could ask other questions. So where are the paradigms of game studies? Where are uh, our, our schools of thought? Where are our methods? Do we have any methods of our own? Uh, and do we have results? Have we actually made a difference? Uh, I don't know. Maybe you can tell me. Maybe not. I'm, I'm just asking. I, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, and that's a bad thing, I guess. After 30 years, come on. Uh, so, I mean, research programs, right? Do we even have one single research program out there? I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that if I have the time later on. Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, and of course, uh, some of us from the humanities might ask, I mean, how can we, how can we actually use, uh, how, what, what do we do in the humanities part of game studies? Do we, <clears throat> how do we approach uh, the uh, uh, humanities and use their, uh, their methods? Is that a good idea or not? So that's also a challenge. Uh, but perhaps we also need to uh, come up with a good answer for this question. What do we think games are? What are games? But also, who are we? to ask that. Who am I? Am I the same as you? We have different backgrounds. How does that work again? When I'm from uh, media studies, literature, uh, you might be a psychologist or an ethnographer or a designer, how do we work together? How does that work? Uh, and of course, how do we work with this big thing called the industry? How does that work? Uh, here's a quote from uh, some years ago. Ernest Adams, uh, who is a rather well-known game designer and uh, author um, and teacher uh, of game design, uh, and he said once, uh, to those of you who come out of dramatic and literary criticism, if you do to this medium what you've done to literature and drama, then communication between us is at an end. Okay. Right. Um, sorry about that. Sorry to be here and, and disturb your, your great industry. Um, so what is this? Well, it's not Gamergate, but it sort of almost looks like it could be a, a sort of early version of it. Uh, I think he's wrong because if you look at what is the relation between uh, literature and drama and the academia, then you'll find a quite healthy and inspiring relationship, right? I think maybe he was thinking about film and, and film studies versus Hollywood or something like that. Uh, but if you look at uh, well-known famous authors uh, who have gone to uh, university and studied literature, uh, they seem to be happy having done that. And this, this, uh, I mean, Stephen King, you all know Stephen King, right? Uh, you don't think of him as an academic, do you? No? Right? He, he actually, as his mentor, he praises his old English uh, professor, uh, uh, what is his name, uh, Burton Hatlan, who's a poet and, a, and an English teacher. Uh, as, uh, you know, that's Stephen King's mentor. So obviously there is a nice, not, I mean that's one anecdotal evidence, right? But there's a nice uh, uh, parade of examples of how uh, we as academics have had very good relations with literature and uh, drama people. So that's not a problem at all. Um, there might be other problems. 
And um, we could, so we can see what, um, okay, so we have game studies, but who are we? And then there are the others also doing something with games, right? And they are, they are not us. And for instance, uh, we can mention so many different types of others of game studies. There is, of course, people doing effects and violent research. Is there anybody here doing that? I'm just curious. Is there anybody, is there a psychologist in the audience doing uh, effect studies? I don't want to, I don't want to, this is not a witch hunt, okay? I'm just curious. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be. And why is that? Because I'm sure they must be doing stuff like that in, in Central and Eastern Europe as well, right? So why aren't they here? So he's not here because he's with a small child. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you don't think he's afraid? No, no, we don't think he's, they're, they're not afraid, they're just not here because they are not, they don't feel part of game studies. Uh, maybe they have good reasons to do that, I don't know. Um, then we have people doing um, so-called ludomania research or gambling research, or addiction research, that sort of thing. They're not here either, are they? Although we are trying to see some bridges. I mean, there are some bridges being built between game studies and, and people who do addiction research. Although there seems to be an interesting divide still. Uh, there's, there's, of course, all those conservative politicians, all those people who are afraid of games in some way. Um, and of course, there's our academic friends from that other department that you've all been to, and they don't like games, so they don't touch that, right? They're not here, of course. Um, and uh, then we have game developers. Uh, I assume there are some of those here. Uh, right, good. So, yeah, great. Um, and what do they make of us? That's a good question. We're interested in that. You may not be interested in that at all, because, you know, you're big, we're small. That's fine. Um, uh, and of course, we have people doing play studies. Uh, What's that compared to game studies? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, especially if you're from a country where you use the same word for both play and games. Uh, then there's game design. Any game design uh, academics here? Oh, okay, one, yeah. So game design is really dangerous. And why is that? I'm really afraid of game design. I'm not a game design uh, academic. Uh, game design has uh, the nice position of being in the middle. Everybody can relate to game design, right? There's, you know, if you're, if you're uh, from the aesthetic side, you can relate to game design. If you're a psychologist, you can relate to game design. If you're a computer scientist, you definitely relate to game design. So game design is the one-eyed king in the middle of the realm of the blind. That, so the, the sort of the, the middle of the donut, so to speak. So even if game design doesn't have a lot of strong theory, they have a very strong practical position in this field. Therefore, they have a lot of, you have a lot of power. Congratulations. Uh, so that's why I'm afraid of you. Um, but anyway, uh, and of course, we have now Gamergate. Wow, that's something we didn't have last year. And suddenly, I mean, who, who doesn't know about Gamergate? Is there anybody who hasn't heard of it? Okay, so Gamergate, oh, how can I say this in one sentence that I don't have time for? Uh, some people uh, were really uh, enraged because somebody had said something like, the gamer is dead. And they didn't like to be called dead, so they responded uh, really aggressively on Twitter and all kinds of social media. Uh, and then there were a lot of uh, abuse directed to women on top of all that. Uh, and so we have this huge explosion of, of strong feelings on the internet, as usual. But now some of it is directed towards game studies and uh, the Digital Games Research Association, which is amazing. Uh, I mean, uh, this is, I think this is, that, is, that part is the best thing that's ever happened to game studies since ludology versus narratology. Finally, we matter. I mean, nobody in, say, fields like musicology has ever had that sort of a reaction from, from <laughs> music fans, right? So think how important this makes us feel for once. It's, it's amazing, it's amazing. And even more surprisingly, I would say that so far, when you see how some of us are engaging in the Twitter feeds and so on, it's actually quite well handled. We don't fly off uh, our handles in rage and flame them back. Right? We, we answer them with sort of quiet humor and try to help them um, find more research uh, into what we do in game studies and, and DIGRA and so on. So I think this is going extremely well for us. And that, you would never have, I would never have thought that before I saw it with my own Twitter eyes. 
Um, so, and if I can only re uh, recommend one thing here, it is uh, Catherine Cross's very recent essay in First Person Scholar, uh, uh, sort of tackling what is Gamergate, how can we understand it. Uh, so, I, I'm not going to say more than just, I, I, this is a brilliant piece of work and you should all read it if you're interested in, in, in Gamergate and what it means. Um, you'll find it uh, at the First Person, uh, First Person Scholar blog. Okay, so uh, back to game studies and back to politics. How can we understand the politics of uh, game studies? Uh, one way to do that is to use political theory, of course. Uh, there's a very old but still, I think, valid uh, theory in political theory, uh, which is called cleavage structure uh, theory. Uh, this was in the 60s, so I guess they didn't care too much about what other connotations words have. Uh, but uh, what the cleavage theory, uh, structure theory does is it's, it says that in any kind of society, in any culture, in any political field, in any kind of nation, for instance, there is these oppositions between strong structures. So, for instance, you have the opposition between owners and workers, church state, the urban versus the rural, periphery versus center, and so on. And so, uh, if you want to understand the politics uh, of, of a domain, you have to find these cleavages, and then, how, uh, and then you can see how things move uh, depending on these. They are, they are what politics is sort of circling around. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's basically a fundamental opposition bet within some sort of population. And why not also see uh, game studies or the field of gaming research as such a population where we have these and then identify them? So, yeah, so basically this is what structures politics. And, of course, there are innumerable, such some are more important than others. And how, how, which ones do we have in our field? Uh, well, um, uh, there are many, right? So we can talk about institutional uh, cleavage structures where you have... For instance, the traditional departments doing game studies and now perhaps new centers and game departments. At Malta, uh, Gordon Kuleja has the first, I think, uh, game research department that actually uses the word department in the title. And uh, I mean, where you find game and department in the same title, that's, that's something new. Otherwise, you, I mean, most of you are probably doing games research within some uh, department which does not have game in the title, I assume, right, if you're researchers. Uh, and uh, then, of course, we can, uh, we can have, uh, we have the big ontological question, what are games, are they uh, basically things? Uh, artifacts, or are they processes, stuff that happens to people, or stuff that people do? That's a big di distinction between game as object and game as process. Um, and it cre creates quite a lot of problems in our field when we're talking about games, and, and we don't uh, realize we're talking about two very different things. Um, so, and of course, uh, yeah, there's all these other, uh, then, then you have to go down and say, okay, so what kind of object is it, or what kind of process is it, and so on and so forth, and which theory should rule, which theory is most important here, is it, is it Goffman or is it Bourdieu, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, the, yeah, so all, and all, all these, uh, then, and then of course you have all the standard academic uh, uh, conflicts, right, between qualitative uh, research and quantitative research, between uh, structuralist research and post-structuralist research, uh, between, well, theory and criticism, for instance. That's, that's, actually, that's actually a big uh, new issue now coming up. Should, should people do, who do game studies be focusing on doing criticism, studying the specific games and how they work in relation to specific gamers, or should we do big theory with big uh, no models that try to frame every game? Um, so that, that's a big issue. Um, there's also, of course, the, the issue that I talked about, well, academics versus uh, uh, designers and industry, that's a big thing too. And of course, this big uh, problem in, in society in general where, uh, what are games doing to us? Are they good? Are they bad? Are they just innocent and fun? Uh, are they magic circles or are they part of our daily lives? So we, can, we then can see, here's, here's one way of looking at it. You can see that there's a, there's a, for instance, there's a cleavage rift between uh, research in existing fields and research in, uh, in game studies institutions as far as they exist. There's the uh, conflict between design research and critical research. Um, and so here we have a lot of uh, potential for misunderstanding and political problems, but we can also then, by, use, by understanding this, we can solve these problems. We can say, okay, I know you're not interested in what I'm interested in. That's fine as long as we can still find some way of working together in the same department, for instance. Um, there's always uh, also this question of, we can, we can use as a case, we can, we can talk about ludology. What is ludology, anyway? Does anybody know what ludology is? 
Do you? Anybody? No? I do, I think. Yeah, what is ludology? That's one interpretation. It's, it's not a bad one. Uh, but many people have thought about ludology in other ways as well. Some people, uh, originally, Frascas, uh, you know, wanted just to have a, uh, some sort of theory about games in general, and the study of games would then be ludology, because that's what it's called. But that, and then you can have a more distinct, uh, sectorized, focused uh, definition like yours. Uh, but it, so it means many different things. But is it a paradigm? Is ludology a paradigm? Can we talk about that as a scientific paradigm? It, it is often framed in that way, the only problem is when you go down to those texts that claim to be ludological, uh, they don't really give us any clues of what that paradigm should be. They more, typically, they more ask for, uh, well, you know, I think we should have a paradigm. That's more or less what they say. And it's a long time ago. It's like 10, 12, 15 years ago they were talking about this. Is it a school? St again, nah, it's hard to define exactly where that school sort of centers, because there's also many ways of looking at mechanics. Uh, so, is it maybe a, some sort of ideological uh, movement? Uh, is it a method? Uh, definitely, I don't think it's a method. But maybe it's a research program. Maybe it's some sort of attempt to make something, uh, and we hope that at the end of the program there will be something more concrete. Uh, but what is it? And for, uh, why does it hit uh, narratology? That, does that make sense? That, that seems to be the main thing, right? When you think about ludology, you automatically think of this other thing, narratology. Any narratologists here in the room? No? Kind of. Kind of. So, uh, I mean, uh, to me, a narratologist is somebody who has studied narratology or narrative theory, right? You're an expert in narrative theory. Uh, you know your Jeanette from your Chapman and uh, Bodwell from Brannigan and so on and so forth, right? That's a narratologist. Uh, so why would ludologists hate those people? I don't know. Does it even exist? That's, that's, a, that's another issue you could ask for. I mean, interestingly, uh, I think this started back in uh, my hometown of Bergen, for some strange reason. Uh, I organized a conference there in 1998, uh, the Digital Arts and Culture Conference, uh, where there was a lot of game stuff. And we had all the big uh, ludology people there. We had Mar Marco Escalin there, Gonzalo Frasca, and Jesper Yule, all collected for the first time. They met there in Bergen in, two, in 1998. And uh, a few years later, Yule uh, claimed on his blog, I think, uh, we need a ludology. But what ludology? So uh, at that point, he didn't exactly know what ludology was. Uh, Frasca, one year after that, at, at the um, uh, third uh, di or the fourth digital games, uh, uh, no, sorry, di digital arts and culture conference, 2001 at Brown University, uh, wrote in his blog, I gave a talk on video games in the play panel along with Marco Esclin and Jesper Juhl. Interestingly, the three of us were baptized as the ludologists, some kind of new sect on video game theory. So here we see that it's not the ludologists who, who sort of take that label. They are given it, and they don't know exactly what it means. Um, and, um, of course, others then, I mean, Eskilin uh, later on, uh, much later on, uh, talks about ludology as, well, it's a debate. It's a founding debate of game studies. And, yeah, yeah, pr probably it is. That doesn't really tell us what, if it existed or what it was, just that it, it's something we can look now back on as a debate. Um, so, oops. Yeah, but, you know, ludology versus narratology. Okay, so, who are the ludologists again? We have some names, right? So there's these three, right? More or less, right? Marco, Jesper, and Gonzalo. Those are the ludologists. There's all th three of them. That's, a, that's a, not a big number. Uh, you know, but maybe it's all not about numbers here, right? So, and then, of course, we ask the other question, but who were the narratologists? And then sometimes it's more quiet in the room. Any, any suggestions? Yes. Anybody else? Ryan. Ryan came later. She, she, I wouldn't say that she was part of this clash between those and them. Uh, because that was, uh, she, she, uh, I think her, her major contributions uh, as a narratologist was uh, from 2006 and so on, so later than this. So I'm, I'm more talking about who were the people who were sort of uh, actively engaged at, the, say, around 2001. Anybody else we can mention? Henry Jenkins? 
Anybody else? No? I think I, I, I would like personally to include uh, 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 Brenda Laurel as, as uh, you know, the instigator of, of this whole idea that, that uh, games should be some sort of drama or, or, or even like a literary Aristotelian drama. So these would be my guesses, right? Uh, Laurel, Murray, and Jenkins seem to be those people framed most often as narratologists. Uh, the only problem here is that no, they are not really narratologists. Because what is a narratologist again? Outside of game studies, okay? Not inside of game studies. But outside of game studies in the real world, what is a narratologist? It's a person who uses narrative theory in their work, right? Isn't it? I, I guess, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't call, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Anthony Giddens a uh, narratologist, right? That's not what he is. He's a sociologist. He uses and, and, and produces social, uh, uh, sociological theory. Uh, these guys, they don't really use narrative theory. They don't make narrative theory. They don't apply it to games. So why do we call them narratologists? That doesn't make sense. Right? You, you don't call a person who doesn't use sociological theory a sociologist, do you? So why would these be called narratologists? That's just weird. Um, who are, so who are the narratologists? It's actually these people. They are the ones who are using narrative theory in their work. If you go back and read what they do, they are applying narrative theory to games. And they're saying, hey, games are different from stories because here is the narrative theory to prove it. Uh, so they're the real narratologists. But then, of course, it doesn't really make sense that they're against themselves, right? So they can't be ludologists against ludologists. That, so, so somebody, I think, set this up. It doesn't ring bells. So who... Who, who put, it, and it's not the Gamer Gators this time, okay? It's not. Who put the N in the L versus N? Uh, can anybody guess? Was it the ludologists? I don't think that makes sense. I, I mean, if you are a ludologist or whatever that is, and you write about games using narrative theory, you wouldn't say, and now I hate narratologists. You would say, narratologists are useful, I use them in my work. So, so it's not against, it's actually, you know, ludologists uh, using or abusing narr narratologists, uh, which is very different from, from this versus thing. So, um, do we have a guess? I've tried to find the first time anybody uses this phrase, ludologists versus narratologists. And the example I can come up with is an essay by Henry Jenkins. Uh, back in, I think he wrote it in 2001, where he says, at the recent conference, and he means the Bristol conference in 2001, a blood feud threatened to erupt between the self-proclaimed ludologists, I don't know if they were self-proclaimed, but anyway, who wanted to see the shift focus, or the focus shift onto the mechanics of gameplay, and the narratologists who were interested in studying games alongside other storytelling media. So this is the first time you see this sort of uh, framing of ludologists versus narratologists that I've found. And, it, it, okay, it wasn't ludologists, anyway. So, uh, I don't really have time to go into ludology much. I seem to be running heavily out of time. How long? You never told me how much I have. Okay, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay, I'll do my best not to abuse uh, your generosity, uh, sir. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, let's try. Uh, so, yeah, so ludology can be at least four different things. It can basically just mean we want our own field here. That's something that I've argued, uh, or as uh, Francis, uh, Myra um, uh, in Tampere has argued, uh, we need to have our own discipline. But anyway, it could be just you know, this idea, we need our own field, let's call it ludology. Uh, and, but then you also have something we could call normative uh, ludology, which uh, asks the question, can you have a successful combination of stories and games, or is that impossible? So that is, in a sense, a normative uh, criticism-like approach. Uh, and then you have a very different type of, which, uh, of approach, which you also can call ludology, which is uh, the methodological approach towards using uh, various uh, theories on games. So if you use things like narratology on games, it's not that you shouldn't do it, it's not that, it's, uh, that it should be banned, but you have to be very self-critical, because narratology was not built for games, so uh, when you use it, does it actually fit? And what do you have to do uh, in order to make those terms make sense when you use them on this new area? 
you know, so if, you, if, you're if you're saying, uh, if you're talking about the story in games, then you have to be very specific. What do you mean by story? And how do you link it to other concepts of story? And how do you define story? Uh, a third possibility here is what we could call ludo-hermeneutics, which is uh, basically the study of how games produce meaning. How does uh, the fact that uh, games have this sort of mechanics underneath the representation, um, the audiovisual representation, uh, how does that influence how meaning is made? When it's not just a, a stream of signs, uh, but there's also some mechanical stuff going on under the hood. And then we can talk about how some people see uh, games as basically a kind of fiction, whereas others, such as myself, see games that things that happen in games is a kind of reality. It does actually happen, even though it's just happening inside a machine. I mean, if you go to your bank, uh, uh, your ATM machine down there and want some money out, uh, you, uh, if you don't get any money and you feel you should, then that's definitely part of a reality, even though it just happened inside a machine. So the things that happens in games have a, its own kind of reality that we, should, uh, that we should not confuse with fiction, even though it might seem like fiction. That's another talk. Uh, I don't have time for that now, unfortunately. Uh, but so here is no, here's the first or the number one uh, issue. Uh, for instance, Jesper Juhl back in the day said the computer game is simply not a narrative medium, meaning that it doesn't really work well as a narrative medium. Uh, then you have Janet Murray um, stating broadly, games are always stories. Here's a complete clash of, of, uh, of meanings uh, or, or, or opinions about, uh, about what games are. Uh, some of us tried to make more nuanced statements back then. So I've, I've I said something like, game seldom, if at all, contains good stories. This was written in 2001, actually. I think today the picture is much more nuanced and interesting. There are, there are actually quite interesting stories being told through game software. Um, and also, I said, maybe at some point in the future, this is back in 1999, uh, maybe there will be people uh, uh, actually succeeding in making uh, this, these aesthetic problems of combining games and stories. Maybe that, that they will actually uh, solve these problems. Um, so, uh, basically, what we did have, if we look at this in, in political theory terms, is that we had something, some, some sort of weird position called ludology back there in the corner where we have, so basically, people who want to study games as in, in their own context, not dependent on a different discipline or different department. Uh, and then it seems, then the, the, the conflict was constructed as between uh, that and somebody doing game studies in, say, standard uh, uh, media departments, literature departments, film departments, and so on. But I think that that is the, that is the false uh, framing of this, uh, this little debate. I think it's more like this. It's more a, a, a problem uh, of people looking at what games are, and then people trying to design new types of games. Uh, they're not theorists. They're basically design researchers trying to come up with more interesting new ways of combining uh, games and stories, or making games tell stories. Um, all right, so that's all. Now you know everything you need to know about ludology versus narratology. And uh, please don't use that phrase if, if you don't have to, because it's wrong. It's, it's basically uh, ludology versus uh, designers, I think, or something like that. Some designers, anyway. Uh, but what is the big issue in game studies? So this is basically game, game studies studies, right? This is a study of game studies. Uh, and I'm not talking about the magic circle or whatever ontology or, or ology you're into. Uh, the big question, of course, is can we have game studies as a new department? Or should it be, uh, uh, you know, should it segregate? Or uh, should it be uh, just happening in every old department there is? So should it uh, come together? Uh, from many disciplines, or should it split up and, and just be done in the sociology department, the literature department, film department, psychology department, computer science department, and so on? Um, should it, I mean, so if you want to see it as a department, I think that that's a very interesting, as one department come together, uh, multidisciplinary. That's, that's, of course, a very interesting challenge. Uh, you have a lot of people doing different things, but under the same roof. So you will have a lot of potential for interesting collaboration. Also, of course, there will be uh, a lot of problems because they, you know, how can you get a, 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 a film scholar to trust the sociologist and so on? That's really hard because we are not using the same methods. It doesn't matter that we're looking at the same object, more or less. If we don't have the same methods, we don't tend to trust each other, right? 
you, a structuralist don't really trust uh, a uh, Lacanian and so on. There's, there's just too much uh, bad history, bad baggage there. Um, so then the other, uh, pro uh, uh, the other possibilities is to have segregation. Everybody is doing it in their old existing home department. So cultural studies over there, sociology over there, computer science over there. Uh, and of course that's very safe. You can relax. You're the weird guy down the hall who's doing games. The rest of your colleagues don't really care as long as you can teach that course that they don't want to teach. Uh, so that's safe, right? Uh, of course the problems is then you are isolated. Uh, there is no communication between people who are designing and people who are doing critical uh, approaches. And there's, of course, a lot of, of uh, unnecessary mistakes because you don't see the whole elephant. You just see a part of it, and you see your own part, and then you make mistakes. Just ask any kind of... Uh, I'll get to that. The, the people who are doing, say, effect studies from psychology, for instance, who don't really understand what games are. Um, okay, so how do we change everything in game studies and make it perfect? That's the, part, that's the end of this part, uh, talk, and I hope I have... 15 minutes, great, excellent, that's all I need. So five minutes, I have three problems. Uh, so the first step is to uh, get rid of the ideologies. You know, we have this idea that games are good, uh, that they make uh, you better, make life better for everybody. Then they have the opposite ideology. Games are actually bad, they corrupt people, they, they waste your time, they make you addicted, and they make you violent, they degrade culture. And then we have the idea that games are just innocent, ludic fun, right? But the question is, are games, so the first one, are games really doing good? Well, we like to think so, don't we? Because that, that makes us feel good when we can say that, hey, don't worry about games, they are actually making you smarter, younger, healthier, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, and you can use them to teach. Uh, and of course, is that true? Well, uh, the problem is there isn't that much evidence in support of, of these ideas. So Mark Prensky at the DIGRA conference in Tokyo in 2007 uh, basically uh, said in his keynote there, more, more research is needed showing that serious games work. In other words, we know it works, but we don't we just lack the scientific evidence, so please just do a little research to show them that we are right. Uh, you know, so uh, don't worry, just do your research, you researchers. Uh, and of course, uh, there could be another explanation why there is no evidence for this, uh, and that is that it actually doesn't really work that well. Uh, I mean, if you have, I mean, th this, is, this has been researched for ages, you know, can games uh, be good learning environments? Uh, people have been doing that since the 80s and, and perhaps before. Since, I mean, since Tom Malone, 1980, people have uh, tried to figure this one out. And they haven't come up with, uh, with uh, great positive proof. You can use games to teach stuff that, uh, you know, you would use a teacher for. So, I mean, you can say the same about books, right? Can you use books for teaching? Well, you, you, you can't make the book replace the teacher, but that's what they're claiming for games. So if books can't do it, why should games? Uh, of course, you can use games in teaching, but that's a different thing, right? That's not the same as saying, hey, games can be teachers. I'm, I'm, I use game technology myself to, to uh, make systems for uh, second language learning, which worked well, but you needed a teacher there as well. So these things are perhaps not so good as, as they would seem. I mean, but then you can say, yeah, but what about theorycraft? You heard about theorycraft, right? What is theorycraft? Theorycraft is the idea that everybody who plays games can become, when they try to figure out how the games work, they become researchers. So games train kids to become academics. Uh, do they? Well, yeah, sure, they do. I mean, w you can see people, uh, young people on the internet making huge uh, uh, research essays trying to figure out what is the best combination of armor and weapon in, say, an avatar in World of Warcraft, for instance. Uh, and that is actually a kind of research. There's no denying it. So that does actually happen. But there's only a few people doing it, right? So you have 10 million World of Warcraft players and maybe a couple of hundreds are really engaged in this which does not make for a great statistical proof that games make you, turn you into a researcher. These young, bright people who are doing that would probably be doing the same thing on a different topic if they didn't play the game. They would do it with butterflies or 
you know, uh, geological rocks, anything like that, that they would put their mind to studying, they would do it in the same way. So it's not the games that teach them this, it's just that they found an interesting topic here uh, to spend their already existing talent on. So for every theory crafter, how many people are not theory crafters? And the answer is uh, the, the vast majority. Uh, right. So, um, so that was that. Okay, G games are not really good. Well, maybe, but not really. We don't know. Uh, we shouldn't believe it before we know it. Uh, then, of course, is the other question, right? So do games uh, teach us to be more violent? And yes, people have found out that yes, they do. So they, there was a study by Craig Anderson and his company, and, or his people, and they said that, okay, we test people, uh, we, so, uh, some play um, Wolfenstein 3D, some play Myst, and we found that the people who play Myst uh, are not aggressive afterwards, but the people who play Wolfenstein are aggressive afterwards, and therefore violent games make you aggressive. So what's wrong with this comparison? What, what is obviously not a good way to, to, find, to answer this question? I mean, they could still be right, but this is not the way to show it, right? Because uh, obviously, a, um, uh, when you compare games that are so uh, mechanically uh, and dynamically different as these two, you haven't isolated the factor you're looking for, that is violence. We don't know if it's the violence in, in uh, Wolfenstein that makes a difference or if it is basically just the fast pacing compared to the really uh, slow uh, meditational uh, pacing of, of mists, right? So violence cannot be uh, isolated as a factor. They did another study and that, this time they said, let's use more games. So they had four violent games and four unviolent games. So we have Carmageddon, Duke Nukem, Mortal Kombat and Future Cop on one side versus uh, Glider Pro, um, 3D Pinball, Austin Powers, and they don't even say which Austin Powers game it is. There are more than one, so we have no idea what that was. Or Tetra Madness. <clears throat> so again, can you, see the, can you see the strange problem here? That one is, this one is basically just glide, flying an airplane, a paper airplane through some rooms. And uh, 3D Pinball is basically just playing pinball on the screen. So Austin Powers, no idea. And Tetra Madness is sort of a 3D Tetris-like thing. Versus these other games where you have a fast-moving, you have first-person perspective avatar moving in, in a 3D world, so you have to navigate, orient yourself quickly. And so basically, the same problem, uh, you know, you have fixed 2D camera versus movable 3D camera and an avatar. And so this is, again, an epic fail on, on experiment design, right? Maybe they're right, but this doesn't prove anything. So, that was the violent stuff. I could talk about addiction too, but I don't want uh, But And then, of course, we have this uh, ideology that probably we as game researchers are most prone to be the victims of. That games are sort of innocent uh, fun. They don't really matter too much uh, in any other world than their own. And this is basically, you know, the magic circle ideology uh, of, of uh, Hao Singha and, and Kaiwa where games are outside of uh, ordinary life, they don't really mean much outside their little circles. Um, and, uh, but the problem with these, they, they, okay, they were also, like some of us, uh, writing in a complete vacuum where they had no critical feedback from their peers. So we should forgive them a lot since they were so early. Uh, but, uh, I mean, Hoisingha is making this, this sort of uh, uh, claim that games are... Uh, uh, really uh, some, some sort of um, non, uh, some sort of pure activity, almost like, like, uh, like a 19th century I idealist uh, take. But in doing so, he is basically ignoring the bloody history of, of gaming and, and, and ludic activities. He is, uh, he is uh, ex uh, as, as, a, as a critic of culture, as, as, as a cultural historian, he is ignoring the most important uh, play game culture there ever was. The, the, the Roman entertainment of the Colosseum and the, the uh, Ludi Romani, right? Which was nothing at all like he claims that games, uh, that games are. 
Uh, Kaiwa also does a little bit of, of uh, violence to the notion of ludus because he, he, he reduces the notion of ludus, which in, in the original Latin was a very rich concept, included a lot of different things, both violent and just uh, pleasant fun. He, he sort of compresses that into the corner of rules and rigidity. Um, so again, this is also a kind of problematic ideology. But if you're just reading one Game Studies article this year, besides uh, Catherine Cross's, of course, uh, you should read this one, uh, Homo Ludens Revisited, 1968, by Jack Elman, which sort of takes these two guys, uh, Roger and Johan, to pieces by, by showing how they s contradict each other. They're saying that play is outside of ordinary uh, reality, but yet it is also the basis of that reality. So that's a very strange claim to make. And also that they seem to be making this very untenable dichotomy between uh, games as uh, sort of serious, uh, useful, I mean, because, because sorry, between uh, the uh, part of life that is serious and useful and work and reality, and then we have games on the other hand, which is the opposite, right? Play, it's gratuitousness, it's sterility, it's leisure, it's the unreality. This sort of distinction between uh, games uh, on, the other, uh, on one hand and uh, serious life on the other uh, is, uh, in modern games, there is no longer a tenable, uh, tenable position, right? We have moved beyond that. We, we see how important games are to people's ordinary lives. There is no, uh, there is no games on one side and real life on the other. It's, uh, games are part of real life now. Um, all right, so I was going to talk about definitions, but I think I'll skip that because who cares to hear about definitions, right? Uh, it's not that important. Uh, but still, we need what we do need here uh, in our field. We don't need definitions, but we do need a good game ontology. We need uh, some sort of explanation of what, uh, what games uh, consist of. What is a game, really? What, how can we understand the concept of games? For that, we need ontology, I guess, game ontology. So basically, some sort of uh, common terms and common terms that can be used by more than just one discipline. So if we have problems understanding each other, uh, I'm a, uh, I'm a, a say, a humanist, and if you're a sociologist, and we don't really understand what we mean when we say games, and we are misunderstanding each other because we don't understand that we don't understand, then we, we should have some sort of common ground and understand why we don't understand each other, at least. So uh, a definition of games uh, don't have, I mean, we don't need to define games, but we do need to describe them in a way that we can, we can usefully discuss what they are. So, but I do have a definition of games myself, um, and it's a very really bad definition. Uh, it's, yep, it's this one. Uh, Basically, games, uh, I think that uh, games are simply some sort of facilitator that structure behavior and it's usually for entertainment purposes. Uh, that is a bad definition of games because it includes stuff that you wouldn't necessarily think of as games. For instance, it, it would include playing an inst a musical instrument. But since I don't believe really you can define games, I, I think that it's fine to also include things that are, to me, more or less the same as playing games anyway. So, um, okay, so get rid of ideologies, first step. The second step is to clean up uh, reviewing processes. If we want a field, we need to police uh, it for quality. We, if we want a field, we should also want a field where good research happens and where good research is strengthened by good uh, critical reviewing processes. Right? So, I mean, basically, you don't want uh, to have reviews like this one. If, if a review I got, uh, a few years ago from, from the Degro conference, which simply said, this was all, the whole review for my rejected paper, uh, a significant research trajectory is characterized as absent, didn't say which one, uh, and a two, year, and a two decade old, mis, uh, two decade old mischaracterizations of media debates are repeated and altered, but didn't say which ones they were, and then none, not of academic quality, says a colleague who sits next to me. So that's good to know that this colleague actually has this opinion. So th if this is the level of quality of reviews, we are in deep trouble. Actually, when I submit papers to the Degro conference or abstracts, I always submit at least three to make sure I get in for the, for the right reasons, because all my best work has been rejected 
from that conference. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's just a, a tip. If you want to get into to these conferences, never uh, submit only one paper or one abstract, because this is a lottery more often than not, unfortunately. So this is something we need to fix, right? Uh, so basically, we need quality assurance. Uh, otherwise, we will not get respect from other fields. And that's something we really need. So uh, basically, if you are uh, organizing a com uh, conference, uh, don't recruit, uh, don't recruit uh, reviewers uh, and let them self-nominate. Only pick people that somebody trusts. Uh, and don't use PhD uh, students from some school which is not game studies related because they lack the, uh, the training, they lack the, the literature uh, understanding. Uh, and always do meta reviews. Always look at what the reviewers are doing and make sure that they are not getting away with abusing uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, faulty uh, reasoning for, for rejections. You should always also have at least three, better four reviewers on each paper because if you only have two reviewers and one is lukewarm and the other doesn't like the paper, then that person who doesn't like the paper gets all the power and that's not what peer review is about. Peer review is not letting one person decide what gets in and what gets out. Um, and of course for DIGRA, not necessarily, I don't know what the categories here, but don't use categories like theory, right? There's so many different theories so that doesn't make any sense. Uh, peer review is very important, and even the Gamergate people realizes that. So if, if even they see it, uh, it should be pretty obvious. Uh, of course, the third step is to, uh, we need, what we do need also is some sort of collective research programs. Um, nearly there. Uh, and, and that is basically, uh, uh, you know, your Imre Lakatos, right? So we need uh, uh, research programs, initiatives uh, made by many people, uh, well, more than one anyway, and which takes a long time to finish, uh, and uh, different uh, complementary projects uh, working together, uh, and uh, you know, with the same uh, empirical goal and object in mind, and this should lead to some sort of new theory. That's something we haven't done a lot of. There's a few attempts, like, uh, I mean, there's platform studies, right? That's that's a good example of something like that. There's also in Sweden and Finland, they have the LARP studies, which is uh, LARP research, which is pretty good. I'm, I'm not sure this, if there's anything else out there at the moment. There might be, but we need more of that. And we need to find our, uh, you know, grand challenges. What are the grand challenges of, of game studies, right? Do we have any kind of common goals that we can identify? What, what are we really looking for in this research? Uh, and, uh, you know, and we don't, I don't think, even think we have those terms which can establish that interdisciplinarity uh, yet. Uh, maybe we can at some future point contribute to other fields. Uh, so the best test for, for uh, our uh, quality or, or the value of what we do is can we contribute to other fields? Have we contributed anything to other fields? I'm not so sure we have done that yet, but uh, before we do, uh, we are not really doing all we can. Uh, and of course we shouldn't be modest about this. Uh, definitely that will not get us any external funding. Um, so to conclude, um, here are three future scenarios. What happens next? I can see three scenarios uh, playing out, say around, uh, I mean, if we fast forward to, say, 25 years from now, uh, we will have achieved uh, massive multiplayer, uh, you know, maybe not like a film department, but maybe something like an architecture school where people from many different disciplines work together to, you know, produce architects, but also understanding of urban cities, structures, and all the stuff that goes on, right? So that could be one model to strive for. Um, you know, groups of specialists in different disciplines, but working closely together and, and, and educating people. So that, that's, that's perhaps the, the sort of rosy scenario. Then we have what we could call battlefield CP snow, where you have uh, existing fields doing their own things in the uh, old departments, and there's very little cross-communication, maybe some fighting at some point where people just disagree in public. Um, that's easily uh, and more, I guess, sinister for me at least uh, scenario. Maybe for some of you that's the way it should be and will be and is. Uh, and of course, the, then we have the worst possible scenario where we, we were successful for a while, but we, you know, we couldn't really make it work on a grander scale. So we had too many PhD students who couldn't find jobs, and so they shut us down. Because obviously this is a waste of money and time. Um, so that was my horror visions for today, and thank you for your patience. Sorry for abusing the time, and uh, I don't think we have time for questions.